We're just always trying to figure out what is the root cause? Why is this person in front of us not able to lose weight through reasonable measures? So we're just gonna do all the tests we can do until we figure out root cause Ooh. and then we're gonna fix it. Yes. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Jessica Carfanini, naturopathic doctor, and today I'm going to be chatting with my colleague, Dr. Tracy Cook, who's also a naturopathic doctor here at Thunder Bay Naturopathic Clinic. Today we're going to be addressing why some people have trouble losing weight and also why some people are having trouble sleeping at night. So tune in and if you find it interesting, share it with your friends. Okay, so lately I've had a lot of patients come to me to talk about how they want to lose weight and they're struggling mm -hmm. with maintaining a healthy weight even though they're eating very healthy diets and they're exercising regularly. So have you been seeing this in your practice as well? Yeah, I think when a person comes and talks about weight loss, the first thing to determine is that is the weight loss is is a person unable to lose weight right if, if a person is not moving their body and they're not eating in a terribly healthy way um and they're gaining weight well then that's understandable but if they're doing everything right and certainly you must have seen people like this as well yeah. you look at what they do in a day and the exercise they get in a week and they you look at what they eat and and you know, they, they're eating better than I do. And yeah, they're exercising so, more than I am and, and they're sitting in front of me at twice my body weight and you think there's something wrong. Well, and you exercise quite a bit. Too. I exercise so quite a bit. <laughs> so if they're exercising more than you, it's a lot. Um, so it's interesting because we're trained to believe that it's all about calories in, eating, mm -hmm. versus calories out. So energy expenditure, exercise movement. Yeah. Um, but it's more complicated than that because we all have our own unique constitutions, our own mm -hmm. unique hormonal systems or endocrine systems. So tell me about the things that you investigate when you realize yeah. this is not a case of calories in, calories out. When it's not a case of calories in minus calories out, when it is, then the default explanation is that it's a, an endocrine or a hormonal problem. Mm -hmm. And our job is to then investigate all the potential hormone systems that are causing that problem. And there's many of them. And hormones are really interesting. If you, if you look at all the hormones in the body, you can map them out. It looks like a spider's web, right? Yeah. Like it's this one and then this one and this one, and they're all interrelated. And so you change one thing, all of them change. And Which is a, a frustrating thing for people because one thing might be out of balance and the whole spider web of hormones is mm -hmm. affected but yeah. from our perspective it's a good thing because maybe just one naturopathic intervention can get things back in balance yeah and you think about polycystic ovarian syndrome as a classic example of that mm -hmm. where also known as pcos pcos and uh pcos is what the person sees is you have an individual who is not getting a regular menstrual period, mm -hmm. typically. Um, and they also have a lot of trouble losing weight sometimes. And the underlying hormonal imbalance behind that is either insulin or cortisol. Mm -hmm. So, but then you're seeing problems like with their estrogen and their progesterone and their testosterone but the original problem is either cortisol or insulin, both of which yeah. can cause weight gain. Weight gain and acne, and usually it's mm -hmm. a specific type of acne, right? Like that yeah. deep cystic acne on the on jawline. The jaw or on the chest. Chest, back even. Yeah. Um, or hair growth in those areas as well. Mm -hmm. um, that usually has to do with the high testosterone, right? Yeah. And then we, what do we also see? So lack of period, the acne, hair growth. Oh, loss of... Um, head hair as well yeah you lose hair like him yeah yeah so those are the main things we see yeah. with pcos and of course infertility so if someone's trying to get pregnant mm -hmm. pcos can get in the way of that yeah um so when i'm trying to explain pcos to my patients i sometimes say well it's like diabetes of the ovaries which mm -hmm may or may not make sense to folks, but <laughs> um, maybe we can explain a bit more about that, like how the ovaries need to respond to insulin and... The 
Well, I, I think that PCOS is either driven by high insulin levels or by high cortisol levels. Mm. There's two. And they're commonly called classic PCOS and thin PCOS. Yeah. If it's cortisol driven, the person can be quite thin. Yeah. And in classic PCOS, because of the insulin resistance, you also have very easy weight gain and the person will sit in front of you and say, it doesn't matter what I do, I can't lose weight. And I'm yeah. like, that's just because you've been given the wrong advice this whole time. Right. Because there is a way to lose the weight when you have insulin resistance. But wait, before we talk about that, we should tell folks about how do we test for insulin resistance? Yes. So if a person is has a concern of uh, an inability to lose weight, there's some mm -hmm. basic testing that we, we always run. You always run a thyroid panel to see what the thyroid is doing because the thyroid runs the metabolism. And then you run a fasting insulin and a fasting glucose. And we look at the ratio between those two to mm -hmm. see if there's insulin resistance. Uh, we may also run cortisol testing. Mm -hmm. Those three hormonal systems do have an impact on weight. There are other hormonal systems that impact weight gain, easy weight gain and difficult weight loss, mm -hmm. including testosterone, including estrogen, and including ghrelin and leptin. Um, however, with ghrelin and leptin, there you can test for it, but the testing doesn't tell you what you need to know. What I find too is that once we've tested the thyroid, and we've looked at insulin resistance and cortisol levels, we can usually deal with the root cause right there. And yes, 99% of the time, yeah. you have your answer. You have your answer and you can then develop a treatment plan. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about that. Like how would we treat insulin resistance? Well, I have my favorite supplements and then of course there's the diet. Do you wanna talk about uh, diet? a diet? Yeah, insulin for sure. Resistance? Um, and diet and exercise go hand in hand mm -hmm. for insulin resistance. So it's really about um, like a low glycemic index diet or low glycemic load, very similar to what um, the way you would need to eat if you have diabetes. Yes. So it's really about keeping your blood sugar very balanced because as you eat um, sugars throughout the day or high glycemic index foods, your blood sugar spikes mm -hmm. and then you can have that crash where you feel like you're dropped off the edge of the cliff and all of a sudden you're tired and cranky. People call it hangry now. Yeah. Um, so you'll know if your blood sugar is not regulated because you'll be having those, um, those spikes and those dips. So in order to keep your blood sugar stable, you need to go for low glycemic index foods. So protein, fiber, fats, and then keeping sugars to a minimum. Um, some fruit is okay, of course. We need fruit in our diet, but it's good to pair it with um, with a protein or a fat. Mm -hmm. So, for example, some of the snacks I might recommend are like hummus with vegetables, right? Hummus mm -hmm. has beans and tahini in it. Um, I might recommend um, nuts with a fresh piece of fruit. I never recommend dried fruit because no. it just acts like candy or sugar in the body. Yeah. Um, and then we look for all sources of sugar in the diet. Um, you know, if you're getting takeout coffee, then there's probably a lot of sugar in there. Mm -hmm. um, we look for all those hidden sources and we support patients in having that low glycemic index diet and finding some kind of exercise that they enjoy. We always say to folks, if you hate going to the gym, don't get a gym membership, Do right? Do something else. Do something, Do you, something you actually you like. like. Yep. And we strongly believe that everyone can find some type of exercise that they enjoy. Yeah, it's just a matter yeah. of determining what it is. I always, I had a client years ago, it's my, one of my favorite stories, and we kept talk. we kept going back to it. Okay, well, you need to move more, and what's that gonna look like? Oh, well, I don't like the gym, and I don't like well, walking. Well, she, she just was convinced she hated exercise, She was convinced right? she yeah. hated exercise, yeah. This was a, a middle-aged individual, and uh, she, she had never liked exercise. She'd never enjoyed it. Um, she didn't mm -hmm. think of herself as someone who exercised. Yeah. And then after, you know, uh, she'd been a client for a number of years and she came in one day and said, Tracy, I found it. <laughs> and I said, you found what? And she said, I really like Irish dancing. <laughs> and I said, that's fantastic. Yeah. And that was her thing. She just, you know, she didn't like it. I don't know if it just didn't hit that 
exercise <laughs> category in her brain, so she yeah. didn't have resistance. But it, you know, she found it complicated enough that it was intellectually interesting and she liked music and that's know. awesome and that i just um, so yeah everyone was, can find their thing everyone can find their thing exactly yeah, it's just a matter of looking at the very least you know i often will prescribe a, a lunchtime walk because it's mm -hmm. shocking to me how many people work nine to five jobs but they're not leaving their desk at lunchtime and i said well what are you doing at lunch um and you know you get an hour for lunch right they're like yeah i do I usually sit at my lunch, I eat, and I do work. I said, oh, so you're volunteering for your employer? Because <laughs> that hour is yours, like, yeah. legally. And so I encourage you to, if you need to eat at your desk, fine, eat, and then get up and leave. Like, just walk 10 minutes down the road and come back. Even just getting that 20-minute walk in, mm -hmm. that helps your overall health in so many ways. But it helps with insulin resistance. It shows yeah. your muscles are moving, and so they need to absorb the glucose or the the sugar in your blood yeah yeah the other thing was diet and insulin um insulin resistance uh yeah absolutely low glycemic and your comment mm. about fruit you know moderate intake of fruit but yeah. not dried fruit i find that grains are more problematic than fruit is yeah um, unless they're very unprocessed mm. and i I often will end up at a point where I say you can have grains, but you have to be able to look at it and know what it is. Right. Right. Like you, you can look at a piece of wild rice or ground or brown rice or quinoa and you know what it is. Yeah. But if you look at a tablespoon of flour, it could be anything. Right. So therefore you can't have it. Yeah. Um, or pasta, right? Or you don't pasta. Know what the you don't made know. out of. Yeah. But pasta is often problematic. Not always, but often it is. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is uh, a discussion about intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which isn't a diet. It's a pattern no, of eating. It's a pattern of eating. Yeah. And, and it's not appropriate for everyone. No. If there's cortisol imbalance, so if there's been a chronic stress pattern and cortisol is dysregulated, you do not tolerate intermittent fasting. So mm -hmm. it's worth a try for just about anybody. But if you have a diagnosis of insulin resistance, absolutely, that's one of the things we look at. And typically, mm -hmm. a person with insulin resistance, I find, will, they don't want to eat breakfast. Right. They, these are the folks who say, I'm not really hungry in I'm the morning. Really I'm not a breakfast person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I think many of us were taught the idea that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Mm -hmm. That's only true for some people. It's it, not true for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so there's a discussion about that. But if you do try intermittent fasting and you feel terrible, then you should not do it. Yeah. Obviously, there is a something else going on. Mm -hmm. You probably don't have insulin resistance. There are benefits to intermittent fasting for just about everybody. But if there's a cortisol dysregulation, then intermittent fasting is going to cause far more harm than benefit. Yeah, you're going to end up burnt out you're sooner. Gonna burn. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's if you doesn't feel good, you don't do it. And there's different types of intermittent fasting, mm -hmm. too. Like even just fasting for 12 hours overnight is still considered intermittent fasting. Yeah. So for a lot of people, that just looks like cutting out the evening snack. Yeah. And that's often what I'll su suggest yeah. to start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should talk a little bit more about thyroid, though. Like what mm -hmm. is the thyroid? What, what does is it do in the body? And why is it important to have it balanced? So the thyroid is a gland that secretes hormones. And right these, here. it's right here. It looks like a butterfly. And the thyroid gland has the very important job of running our metabolism. It tells our body how fast our cells work. Yeah. Right. Your cells. So in, if it's balanced, your cells work just right. If it's too fast, then you get hyper but tired and if it's too slow you're sluggish and lethargic but also nothing works well right like your digestion doesn't digestion. work well you end up constipated mm -hmm. your mood doesn't even work well people end up depressed people when they have hypothyroidism or maybe you don't even have frank hypothyroidism but you just have a sluggish thyroid or just slightly under functioning mm -hmm. hair and nail changes as well yeah um, you can lose hair you can lose your eyebrows you can lose your eyebrows yeah. your skin is dry yeah, yeah. And, and nothing feels right people are like you know i feel like everything is slowed right down yeah so people do uh, oh and you gain weight and, and you, you can't, weight. can't and lose you weight, weight <laughs> which is what we're talking about in the first place um, just a tangent, though, for hyperthyroidism, mm -hmm. we don't see a lot of that. Um, it's rare. It's rare, number one, but also 
a lot of women who experience hyperthyroidism are like, oh, this is great. I'm losing weight without trying. And I have like lots of energy and I don't need to sleep and I can't sleep. And the racing heart is a little disconcerting, but <laughs> yeah, I'll put off the doctor's appointment, right? Yeah. So, um, but it still is important to get medical attention if you have hyperthyroidism. It's yeah. a dangerous uh, place to be. It's very dangerous, yeah. yeah. And it, when it's extreme, it is very uncomfortable yeah right people are very exhausted by it and they get very weak because your muscles actually get destroyed in yeah. hyperthyroidism and mm -hmm. so you end up quite weak from it and uh mm -hmm. but it is rare so we don't see it much we see um uh, underactive hyp hypothyroidism quite commonly but even more so than hypothyroidism we see that slightly sluggish slightly, slightly sluggish. under functioning mm -hmm. thyroid and the reason for that is because if you go to your medical doctor and you say well you know i'm kind of depressed and i'm kind of cold all the time and i'm constipated and i'm having tired. trouble losing weight and tired then they might run your tsh your thyroid stimulating hormone mm -hmm. which is the screening test that is recommended which is great everyone needs to have that tsh yep. done if those concerns are present but your average medical doctor or endocrinologist can't really treat you if your thyroid's still pumping out some thyroid hormone, right? Mm -hmm. Because their tool is levothyroxine or Synthroid, which if you prescribe it too early, it can throw the patient right into hyperthyroidism, which as we mm -hmm. just mentioned is quite dangerous. So they're doing their due diligence when they wait and yes. see but during that watch and wait period that's where naturopathic tools are really valuable yes because the question of course is if the thyroid's not functioning well why yeah why is it not functioning well and there's there's basically three explanations one is that there's an autoimmune process normally normally hashimoto's thyroiditis that mm -hmm. is is damaging the system and uh creating a what we call subclinical hypothyroidism so some hypothyroid symptoms but the blood work is still okay right not great but okay. like not enough to warrant not that enough prescription warrant of synthroid exactly yeah. exactly and and you're right the doctors are being reasonably cautious in yeah. in withholding prescriptions so there's hashimoto's thyroiditis or an autoimmune thyroid condition that can cause low thyroid function there is lack of nutrients particularly iodine mm. we have to recognize that we're in the middle of a continent there is no iodine is in the ocean seafood seafood yeah so kelp you, kelp mm -hmm. so seafood either plant or animal based yeah. so fish shellfish and seaweed but they have to be from an ocean so not like superior not like superior yeah you can't catch pickerel from your favorite fishing spot and get iodine right uh it has to be a fish that grew in an ocean and uh or seaweed and then the other is toxins that are interfering with thyroid function yeah and uh notably um uh, cadmium uh, cadmium and bromine. bromine and uh fluorine and uh chlorine Right. Yeah, but mostly bromine and cadmium. And we can test for those. And we can test for those. Yeah. yeah. So if, if we're still mystified, if nothing else works, we test for toxins. We're kind of like thing. health detectives, really. Yeah. Like we're just always trying to figure out what is the root cause? Like, why is this person in front of us not able to lose weight through reasonable measures? So we're just going to do all the tests we can do until we figure out root cause. Mm. And then we're going to fix it. Yes, because the first step when somebody is sitting in front of you saying, I can't lose weight. Yeah. And we say, what have you done? And they tell you the extreme measures they have gone to to try yeah. to lose weight. And it's not happening. The first step is to say, I believe you. Yeah. I believe that you've done what you can and yeah. it doesn't work. So now we're going to find why. Because yes. there's obviously a problem. And I've often not heard that before. Yeah. Right? They don't know that there can be another explanation. Yeah. Because you shouldn't need to starve yourself to lose weight. No. And in fact, starving yourself can impede weight loss. Yes. Because the, look at the evolutionary perspective, right? Humans have evolved to survive through famines, mm -hmm. right? So if you're telling your brain chemistry and your whole endocrine hormone system that 
there's going to be periods where you're in a calorie deficit, you know, periods of famine or starvation. Then when the feast comes, you better gain weight. You're good. You better gain weight so that you can make mm -hmm. it through the winter, survive through that calorie deficit time. So that's why yo-yo dieting doesn't work. All the yeah. research on yo-yo dieting um, shows that people gain all the weight back that they've lost plus more. Yes. So because their body is a brilliant machine <laughs> yeah. that is designed to survive. Yeah. And you're teaching it that it needs to put on weight as much as it can when it has access to food. Yeah. yeah. So repeated episodes of, of, of severe calorie restriction always backfire. Yeah, absolutely. So we have so many different ways that we can help people and we're not going to get into all the different, you know, treatment modalities just know that we have a very big toolbox as naturopathic doctors and we have the skills and knowledge to get to the root cause and figure out why you're having trouble losing weight yeah so and not one of the things that we see a lot is people having trouble sleeping mm. so tell me mm -hmm. when somebody tells you when somebody says to you dr carfagnini <laughs> i can't sleep what do you say to them? What do you do? First, I ask them, are you having trouble falling asleep or are you having trouble staying asleep mm -hmm. or is it both? Right. Right. So sometimes if a person is having trouble falling asleep, it could be related to anxiety or stress. Um, we talk about the hamster wheel, right? Where your thoughts are, are like a hamster running on a wheel around and around. Um, and that can prevent people from falling asleep. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they're a shift worker and it's difficult to fall asleep when the sun is up, that yes. kind of thing. And then the trouble staying asleep is a little more interesting. So then I ask, okay, so if you're waking up at night, like first tell me your bedtime, your waking up time, but what time are you waking up? And oftentimes they'll say, oh, it's 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. And I'll go, uh-oh, I think cortisol levels might be dysregulated for yes. this person because cortisol levels um they're supposed to peak around 8 a.m you know so that you can get up start meeting the demands of your day mm -hmm. and then they dissipate throughout the day and then melatonin has the opposite curve right melatonin goes up in the evening so that you can uh you can actually fall asleep you feel tired and when they're in balance they're the opposite curves to, to one another but if you're burning the candle at both ends you have a lot of stress in your life you're the one everyone goes to to fix everything and if you're doing this for years, your cortisol levels will start to be like a roller coaster. And so what we often see is cortisol's peaking between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. And you're waking up ready to meet the demands of the day, but it's only 3 a.m. And you still need to bank some sleep hours. Um, so we need to recognize that we can test for it. Mm -hmm. um, one of our favorite tests is the, the Dutch test, the Dutch complete, which um, looks at your cortisol curve. So it's a urine test and the lab will tell you your cortisol levels through, you know, four or five points throughout the day. And we'll find out, are you on that roller coaster? Has your cortisol totally bottomed out? Usually that's when people are sleeping for like 12 hours and they... When it's bottomed out? Yeah. That's, yeah. That's what... Hitting the wall. That's what we're trying to prevent That's here. what we don't want. Yeah. That's don't worst case that. scenario. But we can see if things are on the downswing, right? So... Yeah. Um, there's a lot of other things we test with the Dutch Complete, like estrogen metabolism, progesterone. It's a very comprehensive test. Mm -hmm. um, but there's ways we can treat cortisol levels. And it's not just through supplements and vitamins. No. We also do um, lifestyle counseling. So we talk about, well, tell me about your life. And so we often hear stories, especially mm -hmm. from women in their 40s, about, you know, they're taking care of older parents they might still have young children or teenagers they're at the height of their career and then they also feel pressure to you know work out all the time or be the perfect cook or you know all of those things that are put on to us and so they're burning the candle at both ends so we we talk to them about that and say well you know, what can you cut out and how can you get your life back in balance, back in balance. Yeah. What else do you do when you suspect that it might be cortisol dysregulation that's waking people up in the night? If it's cortisol dysregulation waking people up in the middle of the night, uh, sometimes it is, if it doesn't seem to be due to stress, sometimes it's due to unstable blood sugar. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And the other thing that can wake people up at 2 to 3 a.m. is hot flashes. Right. Right? Hot flashes. Mm-hmm. And so that's an important question to ask. And one of the ways to tell the difference is to say, when you wake up at 3 a.m., are you ready to go, as you were saying? Right. You know, ready to face the day morning, and you look at the clock and go, oh. It's nighttime. It's nighttime. Or are you waking up with night sweats and you drenched your pajamas and your sheets and you're like, oh no, it's happened again. Or are you waking up and your mind is going a thousand, because that is more of an anxiety pattern as well. I mean, there's so many reasons why people might have trouble sleeping. First question is, why aren't you sleeping? It's not just like, here's a sedative, we're just going to knock you unconscious (laughs) for eight hours and you'll feel better in the morning. Because that strategy doesn't work terribly well. Even with the drugs, it doesn't work terribly well. The question is, why aren't you sleeping? Yeah. And now we address that, and then you will be able to sleep. Yeah, because insomnia is a symptom. It's like a branch of the tree, and we have to get to the roots of the tree. So if you're having trouble sleeping, if you're having trouble losing weight, come in and talk to us. Thank you so much for watching my discussion with Dr. Tracy Cook today. If you think that this is interesting information that your friends may benefit from, please do share it with them. And don't hesitate to reach out to us. We offer free 10 minute consultations for people who have questions about naturopathic medicine. So you can book appointments online through our website or you can just call our clinic at 683-7287.